We're just uh, very thankful for the other churches that uh, God has planted and how we're seeing uh, God, God at work across our city. So we'll uh, have our Bible reading uh, this morning and then we'll just have a, a little time of prayer. So if you've got your uh, Bibles there or you want to follow along on your phone, we're just going to read the end of uh, chapter uh, 28, Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. And uh, at the start of the chapter, we have the, uh, the resurrection, the resurrection morning, and uh, the, uh, the women coming to the tomb go and uh, quickly and told the disciples he's risen from the dead. And then the, the 11 disciples, it says in verse 16 of Matthew 28, the 11 disciples travelled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped. But some doubted. And Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. We just sang about that, that he's with us even in the fire and in the lion's den. I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come this morning to thank you for the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ by his spirit. And we pray that we will continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us, Lord, to grow in our love for you and for one another. And help us to hear your voice. We come in dependence upon the Holy Spirit to open up the word of God to us, to change us, to be like him. We just uh, want to commend uh, Don to you as he preaches at North Adelaide this morning. And we thank you for that fellowship there in North Adelaide and uh, pray that Don will know the anointing, the enabling of the Holy Spirit as he proclaims the word there. And uh, would you be meeting needs in that fellowship? We pray for our brother Simon for healing uh, for him and that you would um, <clears throat> just enable to him to be healed and to, uh, to come back into um, ministry in a full and beautiful way. And Father, we commend the other churches uh, as we think of uh, Norwood and uh, Christie's Beach and Port Adelaide. And uh, Lord, um, we just thank you for, and for Mitchell Park. We just thank you for where you are planting your people and uh, pray that uh, in each place that the, the gatherings will be as a light in a dark place and help others come to know Jesus. We do pray for our city and uh, pray for in your mercy and in your grace that you will just be drawing men and women to yourself. We thank you for the next generation of children growing up here and as they head off now for their, uh, to, for their time, their kids' ministry. We pray for each of them that they will grow up to love Jesus and follow him. And we just acknowledge that that's your work, but you involve us. And so we come in dependence upon you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, well, you know, um, you go on holidays sometimes and uh, you've got a friend or someone you can trust and you, uh, you leave, that, leave them to look after the house. And uh, sometimes uh, you, uh, you just give them a whole list of instructions or you just um, write out a detailed list, you know, make sure you don't feed rhubarb leaves to the chook so we won't have any when we get back or you know, make sure the cat gets its uh, fish every night or it'll get uh, grumpy. So you give all these instructions and uh, as you're walking out the door you think, uh, I really hope they remember those last instructions. 
And this morning uh, we're, uh, we're actually having a little break in our 1 Corinthians uh, study to have a look at the whole idea of disciple making which came up in the passage we read. But we, it's good for us to start to think um, what, are the, uh, what are the last instructions in a sense uh, as Jesus just before he'd, he'd risen from the dead and just before he ascended back in, into heaven, wh what is it that uh, he told us to do? And in Mark uh, 16, 15, he, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Uh, not just our favourite places, not just our favourite people, but all the world. It, it's something of the breadth of his command. And then in Luke 24, 46 to 48, he gives something of the message of his commission. Uh, what's written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things. He gave us the, the message that we're to take uh, to the nations. And then in John 17 uh, verse 18 as he talk, just as Jesus talking with his father he says as you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. And as he shows them his hands and his side, his father sending him into the world cost him his life. And uh, for each one of us, in a sense, to fulfill Jesus' commission is going to cost us our lives, but he's going to lead us into a life that we never thought possible an amazing life following him. Um, there was, um, I read a, a, a book by a fellow called John Scully who um, became CEO of, uh, of Apple. And uh, he was at the time, uh, he was president of uh, Pepsi. And his whole life was about um, how do I beat Coca-Cola? How do I manage to sell more drink than Coca-Cola? And he said, and that sort of summed up my life. I was always trying to win. And Steve Jobs from Apple uh, came to recruit him for Apple. And, uh, and he said to John, do you want to sell sugared water for the rest of your life or do you want to come with me and change the world? Now that's not an advertisement for Apple, but it's just, we, sometimes we think, uh, we, we, you know, that this, to follow Jesus, it's sort of, oh, well, that's, I've given up on life. Whereas Jesus is saying to follow him, you're going to enter in to an amazing life that you never thought possible. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And in Acts 1.8, just before he ascends, he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both where you are, off in Samaria, to the people you don't like and uh, to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus not only promises his presence with us, he promises that he will enable us, his strength, his power. So... Last, last week we, we were up to 1 Corinthians 3 and in 1 Corinthians 3 it, it says, Paul says, well I planted and Apollos watered but God gave the growth. And uh, this morning as we think about this whole thing of disciple making, we're going to be looking at that for the next few weeks as a bit of a break from 1 Corinthians. I don't want us to go away thinking in a sense that it's all up to us. But God longs for us to be involved. Just as Paul planted, Apollos watered, God gave the, the growth, the increase. He goes on in verse 9 to say, we are God's co-workers. In a sense, amazing, the God of the universe. And God says, we are co-workers with him fully acknowledging that the depth of the work is done by God, but that he wants to involve us. He gives us his word, his commandments. So we're going to be looking at 
how do we how do we develop in disciple making in making disciples we want to think what is a disciple and uh, and what should be on our hearts as it was on Jesus heart and I want to give you three words if you can remember three words today the first one is intentional that disciple making will never just happen and then relationships Disciple making has to happen in the context of, of deep personal relationships. And then the final word, multiplication. This is God's way of reaching the world. Intentional. Um, we ended up um, having five kids. I'm very thankful that they didn't all come at once, fortunately. But, uh, but one by one, they turned up and we were really delighted. Uh, they had its moments, I can tell you, and still have its moments. But, um, but you know, they were born and, uh, and we just said, great to see you, patted you on the back and uh, said, leave you to it. And you could look at me and say, well, that's basically child abuse, isn't it? You know, just leaving kids to, to run themselves. And, but that's often the tragedy with the church, that the church sees someone come to know Jesus and pats them on the back and even prays for them and, uh, and then just leaves them to it. And that's not what Jesus ever intended. You know, Paul planted, Apollos watered, God gave the growth. And, uh, and so people are converted, they come to know Jesus personally but our great commission that Jesus has given us in Matthew 28 is not just to make converts, important as that is. And it's not just to have gatherings, important as these gatherings are. It's not just to have great crusades, beautiful and conferences, beautiful as they are. It's to make disciples. And you might say to me, well, is that sort of made up this whole idea of Christians, new Christians are babies, but, uh, and then we grow up. But in 1 Peter 2, uh, God himself uses the metaphor, you know, like newborn infants, desire the sincere milk of the word, the pure milk of the word, so that you might grow up. And Paul, back in 1 Corinthians, he says to, I, I, I wasn't able to speak to you as to spiritual children, uh, spiritual people, but as babies in the flesh. Because yes, they'd come to know Jesus, but they still had to grow up and become disciples, disciple makers. And so a person comes to know Jesus personally, to give their life to Jesus, but that's only the first step in the road of discipleship. So let me give you a definition and um, there are many ways of thinking about what is a disciple but if, if someone says to you well I want to make a, you know I want you to make a certain kind of chocolate cake well you've got to know the ingredients you've got to know what's involved. Well what is a disciple and one group um, discipleship Org. You can look them up, but, um, but they actually used the, the passage in Matthew 4.19 where Jesus said to the disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. And so one way of thinking about what is a disciple is someone who is following Jesus and being changed by Jesus and committed to the mission of Jesus. So we come to follow Jesus, we start to allow him to change our lives, to learn from him. A disciple back in those days was someone who just followed a person and, and as they followed them, they listened to them, their lives started to change. And that's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. We start to follow him and allow him to change our lives and we enter into his purposes for the world, for our own lives and for others. And as a disciple, we've seen that with the Corinthians. They came to know Jesus. They belonged to Jesus. 
He had to remind them of that. You're saints. You belong to Jesus. You're set apart for him. It's like when uh, Peter followed Jesus uh, just before the crucifixion and, uh, and, uh, and he followed at a distance. And, and then uh, someone said to him, hang on a minute, aren't you one of his disciples? They'd seen him hanging around Jesus, learning from Jesus. They, they saw that he belonged to Jesus and was learning from him. That's, that's what it means to be a disciple. And uh, Jesus said in John 8, uh, if you continue, John 8, 31, if, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. To be a disciple is someone who's feeding on the word of God growing in that, whether it's listening on a Sunday, whether it's, it's reading your, your Bible through the week, uh, that's, uh, you're continuing in his word. A disciple is someone who's learning to pray. You know, the disciples watched Jesus praying. And uh, what was their response? Well, Lord, teach us to pray. We want to be like you, talking with the Heavenly Father. And so he taught them how to pray and a disciple belongs to a community where we can love each other and serve and encourage each other John 13 34 and 35 I, I give you a new command to love one another just as I've loved you you also are to love one another by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another so think about discipleship what does it mean to be a disciple it means that I'm going to follow Jesus and allow him to start to change my life and enter in to his mission you can say well this command um, that may, may be fine for for some people whether you're you know uh, sort of been around for a long time but I believe the command is for everyone for all of us to be involved in some way in disciple making. And let me give you a verse that's a real encouragement in that. In Isaiah 50 and verse 4, this is the servant of God. It's, it's passages about the servant of God, sort of almost prophetic of Jesus. In the Amplified, it says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple of one who is taught. Remember, a disciple is a learner, submitting to being taught. But God can give us the, the tongue of a disciple, someone so that we would know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as a disciple. It's a beautiful picture that God could do that in each one of our lives to waken us day by day, that as a disciple, he can then give us a word in season, a word that's appropriate, that we can all be able to help and encourage others. And God wants us to grow in that Jesus told the story of the man who had a hundred sheep and he loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the, the lost sheep? God wants us to grow in our own discipleship so that we start to look out for that one sheep. Whether it's here at church this morning, you know, there are plenty of people you know already, but there's always people that you don't know that you could go and say hello to and greet. There's new people that move into your neighbourhood. It's a lot easier just to uh, stay with the people you know. At least you know what you know. But God says, Jesus went after the lost sheep, the one. And that's what he longs for us to do as we grow in our discipleship. You can make disciples. It's intentional. It will never just happen. But it's as we step out in trust and faith and follow Jesus and allow him to work step by step in our lives and change us and that we can enter in 
to his amazing purposes he has for our lives. But then secondly, it's not only intentional, it's, it's a relationship. Teaching them all that I commanded you. And, uh, you know, when a baby's born, um, you could say, well, surely, yeah, there's plenty of books about it. Uh, we could just give the baby the book. And, uh, and sometimes the church just gets caught up in thinking, well, it's just a matter of handing over a whole lot of content. And it's not, it, you look at the way Jesus made disciples. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that they might minister together. And so those, they entered into a, a relationship with Jesus. And when you start to think about a baby being born, there's a deep relationships going to happen. You, you're going to have to teach them, uh, you, you know, I mean, first you're going to have to do everything for them. And for a young Christian, you're going to have to do everything for them. They may have never read a Bible before. They may not even know what a Bible is. Uh, we're getting further and further away from anything to do with Christianity. And uh, so, like the mother bird almost, you know, pre-digests food and drip, drip feeds it in to a baby bird, that's what we've got to do with some new believers. Some haven't had any background and we've got to help them just as we would help a baby. But the problem is, if we're still doing that when they're 20, there's something wrong. There's uh, either they don't have the mental capacity and we've still got to help them, and that's fine. But for everyday life, we want them to start to be able to use a spoon and, and at first the food's going to be everywhere, but we want them to start to use cutlery and, 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 and learn how to eventually how to feed themselves and then how to ride a bike and uh, how to write neatly and, and how to do so many things. This is a relationship. It's not just a matter of patting someone on the back and saying, good on you, you know, great that you've become a Christian. It's being available to help them step by step. You know, uh, as, as Don sometimes says, it's, it's inviting people into your life. And Paul opened up his life to Timothy. He says, you've, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 10, he says, you've followed my teaching, my conduct, you know, the way I live, my whole purpose in life. You've followed my faith my patience, my love, endurance, and, and you've also seen all the persecutions that I've gone through. And sometimes we can think, well, I wouldn't want people to see my life too much, but we're all in this together. And just because Jesus says, let's go and make disciples, let's encourage each other to become disciples, he wasn't saying that these disciples had their lives all together. They were still growing, but each one of us has something to contribute. Each one of us has something to give. Each one, even if it's lessons we're learning. Uh, you know, how does this happen? I, I just wanted to share briefly how that happened to me. I, I, I grew up um, uh, in Tasmania and came to South Australia and endured all the Tasmanian jokes about, you know, the second head being chopped off and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, but uh, I, uh, I, if you said to me, what is your life about? I would have said, it's a great time. But deep within, I knew there was something missing in my life. There was an emptiness that whenever I stopped and seriously thought about life, which wasn't very often, but it did happen, I knew there was something missing, but I didn't know what it was. And I met a fellow called Ian on campus, and uh, he just uh, said he was a Christian, and uh, was I interested in talking about Christianity? And so over the next few weeks, uh, I was open to anything really, and, uh, and he, we looked at who Jesus is, that he's God, and fully man, and yet without sin, 
and he died on the cross for my sin and he rose from the dead to conquer death and, and he, he's saying that if I called upon him that he would forgive my sin and give me the gift of eternal life. And so I did that. And he didn't just, as much as he did, you know, shake my hand and congratulate me, he didn't just leave me. He said, well, I'd really like to help you in this life. I'd really like to be involved if you would like some more help. And so he actually checked whether I had a Bible. And my good old mum had given me a Bible before I left home and uh, hoping I'd read it, I guess. But, um, but he helped me to start reading it. And then he'd come and meet me early in the morning. I wasn't always awake, but uh, he'd come and help me uh, just saying, well, this is what I got from the Bible this morning. This is a great little verse I got. He, he was like Mother Bird feeding me at first. But he didn't want to stop there. He wanted to help me to then start to have a plan to read the Bible on a regular basis. And, and, and just like you check, is a baby breathing? He wanted to help me in prayer that, you know, we feed on the word. A baby needs to be fed on the word, but a baby also needs to breathe. To, and, and in a way, prayer is like our breath uh, that we speak to God. What comes in through the word and then we speak to God. And, uh, and then he, he helped me with my doubts, my struggles. He, he shared his, his own struggles. He said, we're, we're in this together. I'm not coming to control your life or tell you what to do. I, we're in this together following Jesus. And he, and he talked about his purpose in life and how God had captured his heart over in Sydney, how a faithful believer had shared with him, despite Ian just, he said, I love to bait Christians and to stir them up in any way I could. But God spoke to my heart. And he had a key verse he often shared with me from John 6, 68. Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And uh, Ian hadn't had a Christian background. There was no one in his extended family that would support him in that. But he just shared with me what it was like. And years later, his, uh, his father actually came to Jesus. And he just shared those things and, and he shared helpful things. He said, don't be like me that I became a Christian and I went home and I, I sort of carved the gospel into the antique table. You know, that uh, he just said, I really should have just gone home and started to live the life of Jesus and allow my parents to ask me questions. But I tried to force it and he said, don't make the same mistake I did. He just helped me in a lot of practical ways. And he helped me to get into a Christian community. And you know, you can feel I could never do that because that's how I felt. But, but God says it's step by step. And like the man who was born blind and they tried to pester him and tried to speak to him, he said in John 9, you know, whether he's a sinner or not, I, I really don't know much about Jesus. But all I can tell you is that once I was blind and now I see. Jesus crossed over the sea through a storm to the demoniac living on the other side and people had given up on him. But Jesus healed him and he wanted to go and be with Jesus and follow Jesus. And Jesus says to him in Mark 5:19. Go home to your own people and simply tell them what Jesus has done for you. He wasn't some spiritual giant, but he could go home and tell them what Jesus had done for them. Disciple making, it has to be intentional. It, it won't just happen, but it has to be in the context of a personal relationship because we're talking about transmitting the life of Jesus to the next generation. That's on our hearts as we pray for the kids ministry, that each one of them will enter in to the life of Jesus, for our friends, for our relatives. Not that they 
will do this and do that and you don't do that and that, but they'll enter in to the very life of Jesus. That's what's the most important thing of all. But let me thirdly finish with a beautiful picture of multiplication. That it's, it's, it's like it's on our hearts, not just that we would see churches planted in different parts of Adelaide, but that we would see those churches plant other churches. You know, you can sort of say, um, uh, how will this happen? Well, it's as we start to grow in discipleship and enter in to Jesus' mission, which is to see so many more people come to know Jesus. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He doesn't say that in terms of a terrifying thing. He, he says that to encourage us that we can believe that every aspect of our life is under the sovereignty of God, that Jesus himself is in control. He's not just kicking us out, hoping it'll all work out. He's the sovereign God and he's in control and we can trust him that he will work out his purposes in his lives. So Jesus, Jesus says to his disciples, go and teach and teach so that they observe what I've commanded you. Not just telling people, you know, I, I guess if you've had kids, you will know that uh, tell them once and that solves it all, doesn't it? Uh, you sometimes say to yourself, how many times do I have to tell you? But it's so telling, it's more than just telling. It's teaching and training so that you start to see that, you know, you tell them, right, this is a bike and, uh, and then this is how you get on it and, uh, and they wobble, wobble, wobble and then finally you, you take your hand away without telling them and they just ride and, and, th and they can do it. And, and that's what Jesus is talking about with making disciples. It's more than just telling people what to do. It's actually helping them so that his gospel becomes part of our everyday lives. And so you have Jesus to the disciples who are to teach and train disciples. But part of what you, they are to train the disciples is to make disciples. It's like four generations in, in one verse. And, and you say, well, you know, where did the world get its population from? You know, fortunately, uh, Adam and Eve didn't have to have eight billion children. It was parents who had children, who had children, who had children, who had children. And so when he says, reach the nations, Jesus is saying, make disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples who will multiply across the world. Um, you know, uh, Ian helped me with the gospel and to understand the gospel and he encouraged me to share with my friends. And uh, so one night, a friend of mine, we'd been looking at the Bible together and, uh, and he became, he said, I want to become a believer. I want to give my life to Jesus. And uh, I was really excited. You know, this had never happened to me before. And, and I rang Ian and I said, Ian, um, you've got to help this, uh, this fellow, John. Um, you've got to help him just like you helped me. And you'll never guess what Ian said. He said, you help him. And there must have been a bit of a pause on the phone because uh, he said, but I'll help you to help him. And, uh, and I thought, that's, uh, that's beautiful. I was still scared as anything, but I, but I could see what he meant. I'll help you to help him. And, uh, and that's uh, you know, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. What you've heard from me, Paul writing to Timothy, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Paul to Timothy to faithful people who are able to teach others also. You know, Jesus left a bunch of disciples behind and he said, reach the world. And, and there, was no, there was no institution of the church, you know, all gloriously set up. Uh, there were no Bible tracts around, 
It might have been some scrolls and things, but uh, there was no vehicles to, uh, you know, no jets, no cars. There was, uh, you know, very little money. And, uh, you know, the disciples at that stage didn't even have a New Testament. And uh, yet Jesus said, go to the ends of the earth. And, uh, and, and, and so Jesus has given us a method, a, a pattern to follow of deep intentional relationships with people that will help people to enter in to Jesus' mission for themselves. You know, um, uh, I, uh, maths was one of my favourite subjects actually um, at school, but I haven't always kept up with it. So, uh, but one way of illustrating this is to think about a, a church that has a hundred new new Christians every year. And uh, so you look at the year, so year one, you know, you've got 100 uh, people, well, if it's plus the pastor, 101. Second year, it's 102. Third year, it's uh, uh, 202, 303, and so on. But then you look at multiplication. And if one person helps another over the first year, at the end of that year, you've got two. But at the end of year two, you've got four, well, four people doesn't really compare with uh, 202 people at the end of year two. But by the time you've got to year 34, according to my calculations, but some mathematicians may be able to check on that one, you've actually reached the population of the world. That's the amazing power of multiplication. That's God's intended way of reaching the world. That deep, intentional, relational, multiplying ministry is going to reach the world for Jesus. You know, um, uh, Don sometimes gives us a few statistics from Barna and some of those sort of things, the people. Uh, so I'll, it's my turn this morning. Um, I'll, um, uh, a recent Barna study commissioned uh, by the navigators who are involved with uh, disciple-making ministries said, why weren't Christians making disciples? And 22% said, well, I haven't really thought about it, which says something about the church and how we need to teach and share more on it. Uh, 24%, no one has suggested it or asked me. And 37% said, don't think I, I don't think I'm qualified or equipped. And if there's one thing that I want us to take away from this morning, is that if we've come to know Jesus, we've got something to share with someone else. And uh, like the demoniac, go home to your people and tell them what God has done for you. And it might be that you need to ask for some more help. And, uh, to get, and that's what we want to do with the discipleship groups and with personal help. Uh, we want to be available. I, I thought it was... Um, beautiful when Jared in introduced the, uh, the sort of youth ministry by saying uh, we're not taking, uh, as a church, we're not taking over from parents but we want to support parents in this ministry and help you to bring up your children to, to follow Jesus, to love him and in any way that we can as a church support you in that. So you can start believing God and I just wanted to share with you as we finish a little story of a, a woman uh, in the States who uh, she was a single, uh, she was a, a widow and um, she uh, brought this uh, uh, fellow uh, into, into her home. He was, uh, he was 19 years old. He was studying in the local university and she had him, uh, and it was like a bit of extra income to have him boarding in her home. And, um, and, uh, but she felt led of God to just step by step share the life of Jesus with him. And, uh, and so this uh, fellow um, says, uh, says her intention was to build Christ-like character into his life. And she said, uh, you know, Gentlemen open doors for ladies. That was back in those days. And the correct fork to use with a salad is, 
and uh, the girl you were dating would be a poor choice for a life partner and uh, God has an important work for you to do. And uh, she just, this fellow said, in the midst of all this, she communicated this belief to him that God had a purpose for his life and she cared enough to share with him and to confront him and, and to share her life of Jesus with him. And, uh, and, and he saw the way she followed Jesus and read his word and prayed and trusted him, even though her life was not always working out as she had hoped. And uh, I just share that with you to say, don't get disheartened by this. It was never our intention this morning as we talk about disciple making to put a load on people but to recognise that this is what Jesus has asked us to do but he also gives us his power he gives us his presence you're looking after it's like looking after someone's house and they say as they walk out you can always give me a ring if you don't know what to do and that's just as true with Jesus he can awaken us each day with the tongue of a disciple so that we'll know what to share and how to help others enter into this life of discipleship and grow. That's about all I wanted to share this morning. But, uh, but as I said, uh, that was someone that cared for me enough in my life to help me personally and be able to help others. And that's what's on our heart as a church that you feel that this is a place where you can get help in your life to be a disciple, to follow Jesus and not to be loaded up with stuff but to be released by the grace of God and his love for you to enter in to that purpose. That's the beautiful verse. He's chosen you and has a beautiful purpose for your life. Let's pray. Father, we just so thankful for your word to us. Help us to enter in to all your purposes for our lives. Help us to be a great encouragement to each other and that we are in this together. So we pray that you would continue to lead and guide us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>